I wanted to share with you this morning uh, from part two, Because I Love God. Now, these messages, I think, have came to me from the Lord, I think, because he didn't, God doesn't explain everything to me. Now, some, I know some people he sp- explains everything to. You know, they can say, well, I, God told me uh, X, Y, Z, but I didn't do anything. And then he explained it to me. I said, oh, yes. That is not my relationship. <laughs> and I don't think it's yours either. You know, and so uh, I, I believe that these messages uh, have come because there are too many churchgoers. And I, I decided to differentiate Christians with churchgoers. But we want to minister so that churchgoers will become Christians. And because I love God, there are things that we must do. And uh, last, last week I shared, because I love God, I will live a sacrificial life. And I'll, I'll be God-dependent. We need some separation from who we were before Christ and who we are now. We need some separation. Uh, a lot of times, when it's, this is football season in, uh, in America, <laughs> and uh, you'll see a wide receiver going out because they want to score a touchdown. I want to score a touchdown. That's me. I want to t- score a touchdown, not for my glory, but for the Lord's glory. And you'll see them running, and there's a defender on them. I, I, it's been amazing how some of these young men can just so defend, and they're on them, as they say, like a, like a glove on a hand. They're on them, and sometimes the wide receiver will do something to gain separation. He may slow down with a little elbow in him to gain separation so he can have the ball. And and so I want you to gain separation from who you were before Christ. There's not enough separation. Today, my message is, because I love God, I will live a life that glorifies him. Because I love God, part two, I will live a life that glorifies him. That means you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional. I'm going to say a lot of things that I hope don't don't anger you, but I'm going to say a lot of things about this today. In Romans 12, verses, uh, I say 1 through 21, (laughs) Paul starts out by saying, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You have to need, you need mind renewal, M-I-N-D, mind renewal. You need, we all need mind renewal, or we will not walk or live the life that God approves. We need mind renewal, not just church membership, not just church going, but we need mind renewal. I'm here to tell you that there are too many of us who, all over the world, not just Americans, but a lot of Americans, that we, we don't have mind renewal. When we know, and when we're sitting in, our, in the audience, church audience, whether you're here or online, then God is saying something to us, and we need to do something when God is saying something. Pastor Jackson said, God said, pull into the garage. Well, why, Lord? No, pull into the garage and save your daughter from getting some wood shrapnel and yourself, but yourself last. So that's what God is after in, in, in the church. Jesus died for the church. That's not cheap grace, man. And that's not a cheap offering. That's not a cheap price that God paid for you. God paid the ultimate price. We have to look at that. You're you're not in Christ because of your goodness, about how nice you were, so God saved you because you were so nice. Nobody fits that bill. Even the the quote-unquote nicest sinner is rotten. His righteousness is as filthy rags before God. And so you and I have been bought with the highest price. Therefore, we ought to live a life to glorify Him. As we are transformed in our minds and are made more like Christ, we come to approve and desire God's will. 
Right now, you may have a lot of questions. Well, I don't know about this scripture. I don't know what that means. I don't know if I want to do that. Well, that's because you haven't come. You haven't come or gone far enough. But we come to approve and desire God's will, not our own will for our lives. And I think there are too many of us who are churchgoers, and we want our own will for our lives. But if we would do what God says, if we'll have our minds renewed, then we will discover that God's will is what is good for us. Do you remember as, as a child, at least, I don't know if it was an East Texas thing. I don't know if it was the, the church thing I was in or the community I, was, I grew up in or we grew up in. But uh, there were always, uh, dad and mom would always say to us when we would get a bit out of line. You know what that means? We would get a bit out of line and children will get out of line. And we get a little out of line. They look at us and say, look, I know what's good for you. You know, I, mean, I didn't dare say anything out loud. But I would think, no, you don't. <laughs> you know, rebellion inside. But they did know what was good for me. And, and God knows what's good for you. And when you come to your senses, as I came to my senses when I got a little older, I recognized mom and dad knew what was good for me. And when you come to yourself, then you'll say, wow, God knows what's good for me. And then you'll begin to walk like that, not having your way while you still go to church. Being in Christ Jesus is a transformational life. Being in Christ is a transformational life. You are transformed. You are metamorphosed. You go from being what you were, the creature that you were, to being something beautiful. And so it's not the worm on the tree limb that that is so glorious, but that butterfly. And that's who you are becoming. Paul says it like this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I I, I know people say a new creature. that's, That's acceptable, but it's really like a new kind of thing, a new kind of of humanity. That's what he's saying to us. You're a new kind of humanity. But some of us don't feel like that. We go, well, I'm not. Well, I, we said if anyone is in Christ. <laughs> if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Listen, old things are passed away. Old things are passed away, or old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. Now, behold, all things have become new. Amen. Normally we stop there, but the scripture doesn't stop there. Verse 18 says, now all things are of God. So all, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, Amen. who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Wow. What, what an amazing story. So what I'm saying, this, we, are, we are surrounded by chaos and craziness. Now, let me talk a little bit more about my childhood. My dad would, would say, okay, son, go play with these boys, but don't become like these boys. I wanted to go play with my, my little buddies. We're growing up together, but don't become like them. You're working with them, but don't become like the ungodly. But I'm afraid for us. I'm afraid for us. Now, listen, my passion is what, uh, what moves the heart of God. My passion is the church of Jesus Christ. My passion is nothing else. The church of Jesus Christ. And I want it to be your passion too. Why? That we might be the glorious church that Jesus died for. That's what I want to see. We have no obligation to the flesh to fulfill the desires of the flesh. We have no desire, no, no, no um, desires or commitment, no, no obligation as it were. No obligation to fulfill the desires of any entity in this, in this world. Amen. We have no obligation. The first the obligation is to Jesus Christ. We don't, we don't have to, or we don't owe the flesh anything, nor do we owe anything else anything. We owe God first. Paul says it again, um, in the scripture in Philippians, he says, my earnest expectation and hope is. Now, I added is because I, I, I grabbed this out of, the, out of the scripture, out of the text. And I wanted to make it just a, a little bit uh, different so it would flow rather than uh, 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 quoted verbatim because there were things I didn't need there. But I've, nev- I've not at all changed the thought. 
my earnest expectation and hope is that in nothing I shall be ashamed. We don't want to be ashamed, what? Of, with you? No. Before God. So I'm going to live a life that glorifies Him. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body. I'm going to live a, live a life that glorifies God. Paul says, I'm going to live a life that glorifies God. I, I would that you would say, I'm going to live a life that glorifies God. Not, a, not a, a, a life that would get me millions and billions of dollars. That would be nice to have it. We could do a lot of good with it. But that's not the life I'm living. At the end of the day, when the sun goes down on my life, I want to say, I live for Jesus. Put on my gravestone. He believed God. I want to live a life that glorifies God, and each of us should have that intent and that desire. So Paul says that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with boldness, as always, not sometimes. I'm, I'm really striving for that always. I always... Please, I always please him. That's what I'm striving for. As always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For by life or by death. And so when I live, I want Jesus to be magnified, and that's what I want you to want, that Jesus will be magnified as I live. And then I want to die also in a way that Jesus is magnified. Whether I, I die in a rocking chair or die on the field or die right here in front of you, I want Jesus to be magnified. And that should be all of our desire. We talk about a world gone crazy and a country gone crazy. And if you and I don't think the world's crazy and the country's crazy, we are dot, dot, dot. Paul says these things before he says in, in Corinthians 1, 21. We often quote it, but he said those things first. And then secondarily, he says, for me to live is Christ. You're not going to die a, a, a death that glorifies the Lord until you live one, a life that glorifies the Lord. He says, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. Is that really true of you? I ask you. I know it's early in the morning here. You want something really more joyous? <laughs> for me to live is Christ. That means I live for Jesus. And whatever Jesus wants, that's what I give. He has given so much. We often talk about our soldiers giving the ultimate sacrifice, and we weep over that. And that's not even wrong with that. We weep over that. And we won't weep over Jesus giving the ultimate sacrifice for us. And our children. Our children's children. Our husbands and our wives. I weep. And I want to give him everything that I can. I cannot give him everything he deserves. I'm just one person, but all of us together couldn't really give him everything he deserves, but we can sure try. And that's my heart. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't lose when I die because he didn't lose when he died. See, this is how glorious it is to be called Christian. This is how glorious it is. This is not just some religion. This is Christianity. And to glorify the Lord means I honor him. I esteem him. I do everything to magnify him, not to make him larger, but to make him, as it were, larger in my life so people can see and know. That's what that's about. Amen. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this is what Paul says. This is how you glorify the Lord. You live a life that glorifies the Lord. Don't live for yourself. Now, I do know, I can tell you because I'm looking at people. And I know that there are people online. We always want something for us. 
and you have to live beyond that. Now, there's nothing wrong, uh, you know, with you guys, your husbands giving your wives a, a wonderful life, or, you know, what, the best you can give her. There's nothing wrong with that, or, or ladies, you responding beautifully to your husbands. There's nothing wrong with that. That is not what I'm saying. But here, Paul talks about living a life that glorifies God. Now, listen to what he says, and I'm, I want to say this, sort of addressing the political climate, because what we have found with statistics is that the way the world thinks, you can find a church, and they think that, like that too. Wow. What an indictment. And don't think I'm talking about just one side of you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, like I'm talking about East Texas language. I'm talking about all of y'all. <laughs> all of us. So, so the statistics say that, that our views are not different than the world's views. And in Spanish, we say, que lastima. Or we may say, que vergüenza. Que vergüenza, it means what a shame, what a pity. So, so we should not be thinking like them. We should so influence them that they think like us. All things, you, you guys get too quiet, so I'm going to stay right here. Especially on this left side. <laughs> all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. I may have the right to do something, but I don't do it because it's just not helpful. Learn that. Walk that out. That's why you're here. If you're not going to do the will of God, he might as well take you. Which, 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 what are we going to do? Just take you out of here. We'll, we'll, be, we'll cry for you, but you'll be gone. We'll have less of a problem. Because you refuse to deny yourself. Paul goes on to say, all things are lawful for me. All things. I mean, I, I can do this or do that. But I will not be brought under the power or the control of any. So Paul here, he qualifies this principle of liberty that he's talking about because in Corinth, they're acting crazy. They're church people, but they're acting crazy. They're churchgoers, they're acting crazy. Some of them obviously have been saved, but still they were acting crazy. So Paul qualified liberty with the principle of love applied to both neighbor and self. So yes, everything is lawful for me, but they're not always helpful. Listen, I don't have to wear a mask. But you know why I wear a mask? For you and then for me. But you first, because I was raised that God is first, others are second, and then I, then I am there. Is that the way you were raised? If that was not the way you were raised, you ought to be raised like that in this church. You see, liberty, which was not beneficial, for everybody was detrimental. Because it was not loving. Liberty which was not beneficial but detrimental to somebody else was not loving and was to be avoided. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Am I too t difficult for you? What, what about the, the silent people? Liberty became slavery because it was not motivated by love. I will not be mastered by anything, Paul said. And the Corinthians were saying things like this. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But Paul said, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And so what the people at Corinth would say, man, you know, God made food, and, and uh, when I'm hungry, it means I've got to do something about it. These are church people. Paul goes and says, food for the stomach, and the stomach for food was another slogan. It was a slogan to justify their immorality. And, and brothers and sisters, I, I find that that is just 
too much an issue with church goers and some Christians. Why do I say these things? Because I want you to be different. Why do I say these things? Because I and we are pouring out our lives so that you will be all right. And so at the end, when Jesus comes, you won't be ashamed. You won't, you won't say, rocks fall on me, but you will have walked this thing out. And I'm going to just say, church should never, ever be a beating session, but it should not be a therapy session, a massage session for you to just, oh, that feels good. Oh, stay there. <laughs> but we want to be helpful. Because I love God, I will deny myself. Because I love God, I will live a life that glorifies him. That's what God wants for us. So these people were arguing. Uh, they wanted to justify their immorality. And they argued that the reason that, uh, uh, they, they reasoned that food was, was uh, pleasurable and necessary. So when the stomach signaled hunger, food was taken to satisfy that hunger. So they said that when uh, uh, sex is pleasurable and, ne and necessary, and so when our bodies signal uh, that desire, uh, it needs to be satisfied. And they didn't care where they satisfied it. And there's some church goers who are like that, and they justify it by lying. But Ch Paul drew a sharp distinction, a sharp, a sharp line between the stomach and the body. The body, in this context, meant a lot more than physical frame, the physical, the physical body. It referred to the whole person. It's composed of flesh, the material, and the spirit, the immaterial. So you are more than just a body. Your neighbors may be a body and soul, but you're a spirit, soul, and body. The body, Paul is saying, is not perishable, but eternal. And it was not meant for sexual immorality, but union with the Lord. What am I saying to all of us today? I'm saying that we should be living a life, and are, those of us who are saved, in union with the Lord. So in verse 14, um, uh, the scripture says, And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And so he says to the church. So now in sexual immorality, he's saying the body is the Lord's, and uh, you can't just do anything. You're joined to the Lord. So he said, don't you know that they are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them a member of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. What is Paul saying to us? Paul is saying to us, as he said to the Corinthians, that you cannot just take yourself out in the public sphere and join yourself to just any cause. Because you are for the cause of Christ. You are the light of the world. You are that city that is set on a hill. I know, listen, when they argue to you that America is the city set on a hill and they bring you all of their paraphernalia, all of their documents. You tell them, no. The church is the city set on a hill. Don't you believe that? If you, come on, brothers and sisters. If it sounds to you like I'm anti-American, you throw that out. That's the devil who's lying to you. Now, America is not my idol. I don't have idols. America is a place I love, but it's not my idol. And I think the Holy Spirit has me saying that because some of us are not convinced. Whether we're in this house or online, we're not convinced. And so I'm going to say it. John the Baptist preached repentance until people came running. That's all I'm trying to say to us. I'm not angry. I'm concerned. I'm not angry. I absolutely love you. He says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So I said, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside his body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? So I got a right. I got a constitutional right. <laughs> you're not your own. Amen. Wow. Amen. You're not your own. I am not my own. I can't just preach whatever I want to preach. Well, why do you preach something else? Because I got a boss. <laughs> you 
know what? When I was working in, in, in the public sphere and industry, man, if you didn't do what the boss wanted, you were gone, fired. So some of us want to still do what we want to do because we think we can. I'm almost done. You're not your own, for you were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. You were bought, paid for, by the blood of God's Son. It ought to do something for us. It ought to move us in some direction, and the direction it should move us in is toward God. Toward living a life that glorifies God. You're not going to make it if you don't glorify God. You're not going to make it if you're not obedient to God. You can say, well, Lord, I did all these wonderful things in your name. He says, depart. I never knew you. It's going to happen to some folks you know. I hope it doesn't happen to, to you because they know you or me. He says, you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, which belong to God. I'm going to end here. I want to end in a more upbeat note. I will live for the benefit of others, yeah. I want to live, live there. Christ did not please himself. Yes, but that's where I left it. And because I love God, I'm going to do what he said. Amen. 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 If you don't know Jesus, you need to receive him today. You need to come to him today. Jesus says to us that the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You will be saved. And no ifs, ands, or buts. It says you will be saved. Man, what a promise to bring your old broken down life just like I did, brought an old broken down life to the Lord, and he gave me eternity for it. That's what he wants to do for you. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. I want you to think about that, and I want those of you who are in this audience to think about that because God wants to save you. And those of us who are saved, I want you to ask yourself this question. I, I always said to my children growing up, I said, I don't, want to ever, I don't want you to ever lie. But if you ever lie, don't lie to yourself. Because the worst form of deception is self-deception. You can't get away from yourself. You can get away from that liar in the street, but you can't get away from yourself. This is what I'm going to say. Don't you lie to yourself. I'm going to come back also for the church because I'm going to ask you this question. Are you living a life that glorifies the Lord? And I want, I'm going to give you a, a minute or two while uh, Sister Stephanie brings her team back and they're going to, we're going to worship. But we're going to ask you, are you living a life that glorifies the Lord? And if you're not, I want you to do something about it today. I don't want you to wait. Are you with me? Have I made you so angry that you're not with me? No. I don't want to ever do that. I want you to always know that I love you, and I want to be a representation of the love of God. By the way, my dad loved me, but he always sometimes would take me to the back room. But he loved me. Because if, if he didn't love me, he wouldn't have ch chastened me. And so if this was a little bit of a chastisement today, just know that it's because God loves you. I'll be back in a moment.